Hi, this is Paul. In my recent video about why Proverbs is a great pick for Jordan Peterson's biblical series, I talked about the fact that I think at the core of Jordan's work is a desire for the rescue of the individual and to give them a better life. And I played that little clip from a BBC Five radio interview. And at the core of his work is this idea that if you take on a goal or a challenge that will redirect you and redirect your life in many positive ways uh, to feel better about yourself, uh, your relationships will be better, you'll have more opportunities, you'll improve the world around you. Now, again, in my con in my videos about religion S, religion W, these seem very like very secular values. These are true across the religious spectrum, and I think in some ways this sort of feeds into and somewhat sounds like Sam Harris's rational well-being. That well, here's a very reasonable, based on a scientific view, very reasonable way to make your life better. Pick a goal, pursue it, and your life will your life will straighten out. Now, in a video I did a couple of weeks ago that I still have ringing around in my head, belief in God is not the key difference between Christians and atheists. Now, why do I think that? I think that because, as Jordan Peterson said at the Lafayette event, people have this idea that what they sort of believe in their consciousness congress with the mouthy member that tends to have control of our lips, that we simply know ourselves and we know what's really going on beneath the, beneath the surface. Well, that, that certainly isn't true. And so you'll have somebody here that says God is real and another people person that says God isn't. And in many ways, their lives look very, very, very similar. You can listen to Matt Dillahunty talk about this, about how he used to be a he used to be a fundamentalist Baptist, and then he's given all that up and now become a celebrity atheist. And he basically looks at all that and says, well, that's just all human stuff. There was nothing supernatural about any of it. And, and people are skeptical as to whether a religious S, a religious S program will work. And what do they mean by work? They mean make your life better. I think about David Nasser's conversation with with Jordan Peterson after the Liberty conversation. And, you know, Peterson in that context with Nasser talking about that some of Nasser's own story and his Christian conversion, Jordan Peterson is very non-allergic to religion S. And so he basically looks at this and says, does it make life better? Yes. Okay, good enough. In, in that sense, he's a pretty practical pragmatist. But you're using the, the section of, you're using this, this broad compass of better or worse. And, you know, as most of us know, that's a little tricky because better or worse now or in time, a lot of us deal with short-term better. Well, I find that, you know, maybe drinking you know, drinking myself to sleep every night makes my life better. But over the long course, maybe all the consumption of that alcohol and the uh, the way that's not only impacting your body, but impacting your relationships around you, in the long term, maybe it'll make it worse. And that's that's where Jordan Peterson's equilibrated state comes in and and better in what time frame. And, you know, many of us who who look at, okay, what shall I eat? What shall I drink? There's there's often a lot of short-term self-denial in order to achieve a long-term better. And that's certainly true of very competent people who are very disciplined with their eating and their drinking and their exercise and their money management and all of that. And so on one hand, this 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 better standard seems well that that just that's just an obvious standard that is universal for everyone but very quickly we begin to see that it doesn't necessarily work out quite so straightforwardly and and so people are skeptical as to whether religious s programs will work work as in terms of making life better as jordan peterson notes the pursuit of a goal provides more meaning often than the attainment of that goal and, and the, the pleasure and the, 
and and the very meaningful experience of pursuing a goal once the goal is reached then we're sort of looking for the next goal and peterson talks about why that is in terms of our our psychology there's a sensitive balance between meaningful purpose and frustration if there's if there's a sense that the goal is unachievable well then we get frustrated and quit and some people are more frust are frustrated more easily than others and that gets into a whole bunch of other things so we have standard religion S prescriptions are often indirect and mediated through a personal relationship with something like a super thing. And so the idea is that, well, years of prayer and years of tithing and years of, of Christian self-discipline mortification, years of doing the difficult thing of denying myself, years of doing that will somehow make my life better. But, but in many ways, and this is part of the point of that video I made, belief in God is not the key difference between Christians and atheists, is that there's a certain indirect way that religious people pursue a better life. And sometimes they're pursuing a better life in the age to come. And so they're denying themselves now in order to lay up, as Jesus said, treasures in heaven. And given the history of the last 500 years, there's a lot of debate as to, is that responsible? Now, when it comes to deconstruction stories, and I, I don't know when I'll post my... Um, my conversation with Joe, probably before I'm planning on releasing this video on Monday. So I'll, I'll post my conversation with Joe either today or tomorrow or Sunday. And, and his is a deconstruction story. He was, he was raised in a family, um, homeschooling Christian family, but got sort of, um, didn't necessarily attend church all the time, but were serious enough Christians to homeschool their kids and raise their kids with Bible stories and all of these things. And I, I talked with Joe about about some of that. But one of the interesting things of my channel has been how many, not only how many people have come to this channel because they had long ago walked away from the faith and via Jordan Peterson, are more interested in it now, but also how many people were sort of on the fence and and starting to walk away from the faith, or, or maybe are walking away from the faith, and the current word for that is is deconstruction, and of course, Rhett and Link, and their very public deconstructions, along with all, often seems Christian musicians um, and Christian artists, I mean, that, that's been a very big thing going on, and, and it's not a mystery to me why many of the issues that I touch on on my channel intersect with these people. And many of those who, who deconstruct have been raised in or have seriously tried religion S. Religion S meaning, I did a video on that, religion S being the secular view of religion. It's, it's the stuff about church going and prayer and relating to a super thing and in indulging God or trying to please God in order to be rewarded by God in this world or the next world. That's that's how secularists and atheists define religion. I contrast that with religion W, which is a worldview religion, which is sort of the, the code that is rightly called religious that within which we operate and do meaningful things and try to uh, pursue meaningful things in the world. So that's religion L, but religion S is sort of the secularist definition of religion. And, and and often they're using this sort of better metric. Um, and, and, and while many people who deconstruct wind up mourning the loss of their faith because they enjoyed the community and the comfort and living within that those Christian commitments, they, they come to a point that it was they came to re believe that religion S isn't better for the world, often politically, or, or wasn't plausible. And so they, you know, they have mixed feelings about leaving the faith. And, and some things they feel, okay, I just feel freer than I did before. But there are, there are certain levels of comfort and community and that, that, that are no longer available to me now like they were before. And often when I talk to people in that space, they're, they're, they're conflicted by those things. And, you know, it's often people will, it feels to them like they're, they're going out into blue skies and fresh air and they're leaving the smothering confines of a religious community. And, and to some degree there are because there's accountability. 
But the further they go in, I think they'll discover that really instead of going from inside to outside, it's really much more of an exchange. Um, even if it feels more like leaving, it probably feels like leaving into the blue skies because they had already implicitly adopted the new religion. And so the shoe had been pinching for a long time, and now the new shoe feels like the right shoe or a better shoe because the new shoe, which is religion W, in terms of the worldview, the new shoe fits. And so now it feels like freedom, but it's probably because, again, internally, they had already converted most of their consciousness Congress, and now finally they got up the guts like Rhett and Link to go on their YouTube channel and say, oh, I don't identify as Christian anymore, and this is why. Now, a few months ago in June, I came across this Twitter account by a woman named Joe Lumen, who this tweet thread got quite a bit of notice. Since conservative Christians keep coming at me here, I am a Christian and I believe proselytizing is violence against another. Wow. I'm a Christian and I believe LGBTQ plus people are divine and should lead us. I'm a Christian and I've learned a lot from people who do not share my faith. I'm a Christian and I don't go to church. I'm a Christian and I don't believe the Bible is the word of God. I'm a Christian and I embrace sex positivity, which includes but isn't limited to sex outside of marriage. I'm a Christian and I believe everyone has access to God. Everyone. I'm a Christian and I do as I please, which is not to say I harm anyone. That's never okay. And, and you know, it's very interesting because even though she hasn't, say, fully deconstructed outside of the Christian label, or maybe she has by now, I don't know, the tweet from today was not surprising given the other tweet. I don't care who you vote for as long as you're voting consciously and for good reasons. We're going to talk about that because that's a big piece of this, that a big piece of the, the 18th century and beyond new morality, new the new thing that gives you status that, okay, it has to be conscious and intentional, but very quickly there's a political agenda behind it. At this point, after I... Um, at this point, after how clearly Donald Trump has shown he's a racist and abuser, cheater, liar, bigot. Now, when I put these two things together, it's kind of like, well, is 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 Donald Trump part of everyone and his sex positivity and and there are there are clearly a there's clearly a code that she's working with there a code which condemns Donald Trump but doesn't condemn the people she talks about in the first tweet and, and what's interesting is that both sides have codes but probably early on in a certain kind of Christianity there was a personal relationship and her 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 life was mediated by this might be a super thing. Her life was mediated by this personal relationship with the divine. And now it seems much more directly mediated by her political involvement. And, and this is something I see regularly in deconstruction. Once they sort of give up religion S, self-conscious religion, and then their religion W, basically becomes a political religion. That's very, very common because now, instead of changing the world by prayer and Christian devotion and all of these things that you're doing for the Lord, now you're trying to change the world directly. And it has a very big tie to this, to the first line that she has in her tweet, consciously and with good reasons. It's all right here in terms of the left brain, as Ian McGilchrist would say. And, and and you know I see that in the I see that in the Weinsteins again we we have to our confidence is in consciously pursuing this world with rationality with cause and effect and this is how we are going to do it because again there's no one else who is in charge of the world there's no one else who is governing history so it's up to us but again us is well how much of me is there in us. I might say, well, Paul, you're a you've got 15,000 YouTube subscribers. Ooh, you know, Brett has many, many more and Brett is significant enough to have his Facebook account taken away for some 
reason that was never explained to him. And, and so they're sort of the next religion, but it's the next religion W because we don't want to we don't want a religion that is involving all of this stuff mediated by a personal God. But the point I made with the video I made with John Verveke in 2019, why I relate to a personal God, which is sort of an argument I made, it isn't, as, as John Verveke pointed out in the video, it, isn't, it doesn't conclude the ontology of God, but rather concludes the default practicality and perhaps the wisdom of pursuing reality in this personal way. And that's where I talk about the spirit of finesse and the spirit of geometry and a bunch of those are the bunch of those arguments. And you can find that video and watch it. I thought it was really quite a good conversation. And, and, and what we find and what Brett is worried about is that there's a reason we keep slipping into religion S. And 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 Brett sort of was on the same track as as um um as Ryan Bennett in maybe society only works if a certain core number of people are religious and and in fact religious in a particular way and religious with particular commitments because of course religions vary greatly and so the nature of their religion and as we see India building new temples and the Hagia Sophia being converted back into a mosque and we see th this um, you know, secularity diminishing around the world. I mean, this this is cause of anxiety for Brett because it's like, well, if if we're incurably religious and we can't find any religious methadone, then we could be in big trouble. And and so what's clear in 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 this woman's tweet is that the quest for the better involves consciousness and good reasons. Now, I'm not promoting mindlessness and bad reasons, but but our faith in this is, is sort of indicative of, of Ian McGilchrist's complaint in The Master and His Emissary, that as a culture, we become quite left-brained. And of course, he sets up the mind, as and Peterson was there talking to him, as you know, one of our lobes looks at unmapped territory and tends to be more intuitive, and the other is basically grabbing what is learned from the other and say, "Okay, I can I can make a rule here. I can I can discern this into a syllogism." And and again, all of this is really good. This is really really good because the degree that we can really map a territory is 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 a degree that we can act consciously and with good reason and those are powerful powerful tools but the vision that this can be done to the world is a fool's errand because it's it's hubris it, it just imagines that this is something we can accomplish and we can't the world is too big our minds are too small our lives are too short. History, in fact, is too short. The time, 16 billion years, it's not enough time. And in many ways, the existential panic of, panic is fair, I don't know, of, of guys like Brett and Eric Weinstein, it's sort of founded on that. You know, we have a deeply formed assumptions that the causal links must be direct, intentional, conscious, and articulatable. And I think that walks right into Ian McGilchrist's complaint. And as I've said before, this goes back a few hundred years. And again, what's interesting is that in many ways, well, what were these, what were these, you know, trailblazers of modern science doing? Well, they were using reason, they were using the spirit of finesse, turning increasingly into the spirit of geometry in order to explore God. Now, that sounds crazy to us, but God number one, and that's why they're pursuing and they're saying God is faithful and God operates in these ways in faithful ways. And so actually figuring out for Newton how gravity works and how, how all of these systems work this is religious s this is religious devotion and 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 in order to do this there's a very helpful 
predictable, discernible, practical thing to do in the lab, which is, again, to close one eye and to say, okay, let's let's take out personality and just assume it will go on its own. Let's take consciousness and personhood out of the equation. And again, Jordan Peterson walks through some of this with his stuff. And let's see how far we can learn, how deeply we can go into the mind and practice of God by with this scientific method. Now, I got this language today in the Discord when I was doing my question and answer which you do on Friday mornings. You know, what was meant for the lab broke out into the general population sort of like a virus. And eventually, God number one was forgotten, and God number two became a super thing and and part of the system. And, and that is part of the problem that we are facing now. Again, what was a tremendously helpful insight in order to do science now has become a general implicit assumption, which is, well, there, there, is, there are no persons above or beyond us. That's essentially the assertion of secularism. And again, when you're doing your work in the lab, the assumption is, if you're a Christian, that God isn't changing his ways. And the assumption is that this stuff will be repeatable and regular. Now, this in many ways sets up for us our meaning crisis. Now, I'll play some of this video, which I've played before. It's from Think Big Animation, and um, where this individual was making some, some really lovely animations based on some of John Verveke's early lectures. And, and I think this articulates this movement quite nicely. In this old Aristotelian model, we all fit in and belong with the universe. But we have just been given proof that the structure of our experience has nothing to do with the structure of reality. Now, again, proof or suggestion or evidence, but that's, that's where we went. Galileo expands on this Copernican idea. And, and, and again, these are, these are all Christians. He tells us that mathematics is the language of the universe, and that is how the mind can reconnect itself to the world. Galileo integrates this new math into what we now know as the scientific method, and he begins to use experiments. Again, what's in the lab now suddenly becomes the, and, and when you listen to Brett Weinstein work on this, becomes the, the global assumption for all knowledge and how to pursue it. Someone said, well, maybe we need a, a science S and a science W. And I thought, yes, but I'm not sure S is the right letter for that. And I'll have to think about it. Maybe a science L and a science W. Using this new experimental method, Galileo discovers inertial motion. In this old worldview, things were acting on purpose because of this internal drive to better themselves. Everything was acting intentionally and everything was in its proper place. Galileo discovers that things don't act on purpose to make things more actual and more beautiful. Things act because they smash into each other mindlessly. But each of us still feels that we are autonomous beings. We have our will and we act on purpose, but nothing else does. And that puts us alone in. So now, on one hand, well, now we feel special, like uh, image bearers of God. But we're living in a dead world, a disenchanted world. Instead of acting in collaboration with the universe, we are now an isolated will that doesn't belong. And what is our will compared to all this dead matter? And, and this is going to set up for us one heck of a meaning crisis. The narrative unfolding of a universe trying to come to completion is now dead because nothing acts on purpose and there is no story to things. A universe trying to overcome its inner conflict is gone and the sense of a mutual fitting and belonging to the world around us has been shattered. What is left? Math and an isolated will trying to impose order on whatever it can. And even that isn't real because your experience is faulty and cannot be trusted. And as we'll see in a minute, it's also that, well, if all of that dead crashing into things out there in the world is purposeless and we begin to do psychology and begin to recognize that 
there's all these tricks and quirks within us that are producing us and brain science and cognitive science has continued to expose that and suddenly maybe maybe I'm dead like the rest of the world. And now we have the zombie metaphor. Math is the language of the universe. What about love and beauty? What about everything that belongs to our subjective experience? Galileo has an answer to this. He divides the world into primary and secondary properties. What is primary is things we can do math on, like shape and weight. Spirit of geometry. What's secondary are non-mathematical properties, like love, beauty, and meaning. All but they're secondary. So again, just implicitly already, you see the roots of deism and very quickly, well, these are, these are secondary things. They're not primary things. All the stuff we care about is an afterthought. The world does not possess these things. That is what the mind willfully imposes on reality. Imposes. When you feel connected to things for their beauty, love, or meaning, that is all a mistake. The meaning that was captured in these old worldviews are being withdrawn, and we are now trapped in a mind that cannot connect to the world. This is part nine in a series of videos. So we human beings are alone in the universe, and we alone act on purpose. Everything is dead, unconscious. And so you can see why the woman whose tweet I read, well, well, okay, the world is all group A, and we are group B, and, and we alone are group B, and there's no other group B things above or beyond us. And so it's up to us to save the world. And so the existential panic of, of, of once you get to a certain level and you just realize how lacking in adult supervision there is in the world. Um, yeah, we should be terrified. The lab move to explore God number one becomes viral and promotes the assumption that we are unique and alone. And that, of course, sets up, well, if you listen to Sam Harris talk to Brett Weinstein, well, well, and of course, Brett keeps challenging him on this and, and, Sam and Brett's conversation was a little more productive than Jordan Peterson and Sam's converse, first conversation, but not much. In the end, Brett just has to sort of give up because Sam says on one hand, well, there is no purpose. Um, the world is stranger than we can imagine, and human beings are just math all the way down too. And so everything is determined and even though you imagine that you love and you imagine that there's purpose, that's all illusory. And so Brett is like, that can't be true. Then if that were true, then you'd live differently. Oh, no. It's like when I go to a movie, I'm filled with passion. And, and, and so we can have all those feelings, but even though, on the other hand, we believe we're dead. And so in, in many ways, the meaning crisis hits us for two reasons. The physical world is stranger than we can imagine, and human beings are increasingly hackable, giving us the crisis of agentic confidence. Maybe deep down, we're just deluded in our agency and our personality. And, and this very much sets up, you know, the conversation that Jordan had with Susan, Susan Blackmore which, again, this was, this was Job and I talked a little bit about yeah. this in our but conversation. But I don't think that that's what we seek. I think we seek a meaning that's deep enough to sustain us through tragedy. And that is way different. Do you know, when I hit some, I, I, tragedy is too strong a word, um, I think, I'm, I, but if when, I, when, I, when horrible things happen to me, or I feel, or I read some terrible thing going on in the world, yes, those are tragedies going on in the world. Um, my response is... But, but you know, even tragedy or is it just math what what even the you see and that's the that's again wilfred sellers daniel bonavac the manifest versus scientific image there are no tragedies in in the scientific image there can't be it just is you can't have normative statements or value propositions in the scientific image it just is and so all of this hand wringing about whether it's politics or, or, or climate change or 
economic catastrophe or nuclear annihilation. All of that is from the manifest image. You're not going to get there from science. Well, well-being, okay, but you know the well-being of the uh, of the of the of the my, the mouse that you kill in the trap. It's just it's just power. Nothing matters. It's all empty and meaningless. Right there. There it is. There's the conclusion, and she says it right out loud. This is how the world is. Get used to it. Therefore, get on with it, girl. That sounds like a very Zen Buddhist way of dealing. I guess with, it. I with, guess it is. Well, it's a fun, it's a paradoxical way, though. It is the kind first, of paradoxical. The first part of that is nihilistic, and the second part isn't. So, well, how do you reconcile those two things? It, which, Why get on with it, girl? Because oh, oh, well, here's another thing. I've often done this with my students. Let's suppose you become nihilistic. Uh, nothing matters. There's no point in doing it. I mean, I think we live in a pointless universe. What are you going to do? And I say to them, like William James in his wonderful thing about getting up in the morning, um, but that's a slightly different point that he makes there. But I say to them, okay, tomorrow morning, when you wake up, think it's all pointless. I d there's no point in doing anything. Now, what are you going to do? Roll over and go back to sleep. <laughs> well, actually, you're going to need to go to the loo. You're going to get out of bed. I know plenty of people who roll over and just pee where they're laying, okay? <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry. I've seen way too much life to, to buy this line. Bed and you're going to go to the bathroom. And when you're there, you'll think, well, oh, actually, I'm hungry. I think, well, I think I want to go down to the kitchen. Oh, I've and I've seen plenty of people that they're not going to get up and go, get out of bed. And in fact, they'll stop eating. And, you know, there was one... Uh, elderly man in this congregation who was taking care of his even more elderly sister and she stopped eating and he pushes food in front of her and says you want to live eat that's just kind of how the dude was i probably should put my slippers on why don't i get dressed you go and have something to eat and then you think i'm bored and you go to university and get into your lectures and you know we are not creatures who will just not do anything really i know plenty of them to me, to go through that process, which I've done in the past a lot, and it's just natural now, is... Um, it's just natural now. There's no purpose to it. How nice that it provides you with all of the lovely things that you want. Isn't it just scaling up of your desires? It is a, is a very positive way of living. To accept the meaningless and ultimate emptiness of everything and accept that this creature here, this thing, this evolved creature just will get on with life. But, but, but you're not accepting the meaninglessness of it, even by going through those actions that you, you described. You don't think so? Not well, at all, because you're, that? because you're acting as if well, those things are meaningful. Yes, I am. I'm right. acting okay. as though those so things are meaningful. Are you pretending so that they're meaningful? Pardon? Are you pretending that they're meaningful? No, I'm not pretending. I'm, I'm, my way of putting it would be that those meanings are constructed by myself and others. They're personal and, and right. they're because, than, because but, the kind of creatures we are, because of the meme, meme But they're plexus, not constructed. Because, I'd like to hunger hear isn't constructed. Neither is your desire to use the loo. None of that's constructed. No, no. But the fact that there is a loo <laughs> is part yes. of culture. Yeah, well, thank God for that. that. You know, yeah. yeah. But see, you oh, see. Oh, thank God would you see, do that. Well, <laughs> sorry, that's a poor joke. Well, you see, <laughs> see so imagine this. You, you have the proximal meanings that you described that are sort of a priori, right? Yep. They're handed to you. You might consider them as needs or drives, although they're yes. not. They're personalities. It's not the right way of conceptualizing them. Um, but, but then there's the intermingling of all those needs and drives, let's say. And that, that constitutes a new layer of structure because it isn't just that you have to eat and that you have to use the washroom and that you have to have something to drink and that you have to be warm enough or cool enough to survive. It's that you have to do all those things at the same time in a situation where you're going to have to propagate that across time and you're going to have to do it with a bunch of other people. Yep. And it's always been like that. And yep. so what that means is that out of those proximal meanings, higher meanings arise. And you might say, well, those meanings are arbitrary. And I would think I those are religious meanings. I wouldn't meanings. say they are arbitrary, but I would say they were constructed. And it's very interesting. Reading well, your what book. What do you mean by constructed? Um, well, they are a consequence of, of mimetic evolution, of the, of the language that, that people are brought up in, the culture they live in, the arguments they have. I mean, What about the biology that they're given? Well, we start with the biology and the memes build on top of that. Now the memes are biology too. Well, by definition, they are, well. 
See, this I, is the I thing. Would, this I is would the follow thing. Dawkins in saying, well, talk about genes as biology, talk about memes as culture. That's all I meant by dividing that. But let me say this. Yeah, Re- but I don't accept that division. But I, don't I want think to get back to what we're saying division. about meaning. Well, reading, reading your book made me think a lot about what, what you mean by meaning and your claim that we should have a meaningful life or strive for a meaningful life, that meaningfulness is important. And I kept asking myself, do I... Uh, do I live that way? What meanings does my life have? And, you know, if I think of something like, well, the, most of my striving goes into writing my books. <laughs> and is that meaningful? And again, I have the same response when I ask myself that question. It's just what this body does. It, it, then it, you should listen to the body and stop listening to the thing that's criticizing it. And what <laughs> would the body say? It would say, write your book and try to be as clear as you yeah, possibly can about it. Yeah, that's what I do. And that's right, exactly, exactly what I do. what I said at the beginning, is that the atheist types act out a religious structure and no, criticize it. No, there's no religious well, structure. Oh, let, we let come me get, to this let big get, question Let me get now. to this question, because yes, I did have. want to get to this. Because oh, okay, so I've played this before. I did a whole commentary on that. There it is. If it is meaningless, if your actions don't matter, then you have radical freedom. If you've built, if you're built to be religious, s and you're most happy with it, why fight it? That's the radical freedom of nihilism. And I gotta move my uh, gotta move my head here to the correct corner. And and this is this is where my conversation went with Job. Nihilism, more often than that, just simply induces depression. And it was I went to Australia in March of 2019, and in preparation for those talks, I began look. I was looking back on all, all the different conversations that I've had in the course of this channel, and I began to notice a pattern that many of the men I spoke with, and and perhaps it's you know, Jordan Peterson would make the argument that this is a bigger trial for men than for women because women have this. It's coming up out of their Bible. This bi- this their bodies. This biological necessity to do a certain thing, and and men in a sense have to generate themselves. How many of these men had been suffering from nihilism induced depression, and watching videos of Jordan Peterson helped them tremendously. The world is too large for us to manage consciously, and so. It wasn't direct or conscious the way these videos help them. They just, I want to watch more videos. And and a nearly, I mean, so many people went down that hole that they just kept watching Jordan Peterson videos. Now, there's a, there's a point of diminishing returns because there's mapped and unmapped territory, but something in them was telling them, keep watching these videos because it's helping you. And so this, this rather dead reckoning, rough approximation of better or worse, which is not necessarily reliable over the long term, is certainly of some value and that keep watching the Jordan Peterson videos. Keep watching the why. I don't know why they're helping me. If I go and say, yeah, watching certain YouTube videos are making me less depressed and feel better. Well, you don't know. Well, why? Well, I just know that they are, so I'm keeping doing it. Okay. And that's better than necessarily drinking yourself to sleep or just playing computer games unendingly. The world is too large for us to consciously manage, consciously with reasons in that in that left brain articulated, reduced map territory self. We are formed and maintained if, with culture net, with religion W, okay? Practices and rituals and routines are um, that are indirect are are of enormous importance. And you know, and you know, so again. You, I think the picture here of 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 John Verveke and Christopher Mastro Pietro of their their video about the symptomology of the meaning crisis and and so what often people need are and, and actually pastorally people come to me and their life is a mess and this isn't I, you know I borrow this trick from a lot of psychologists that I hear saying the same thing well do you go to bed on so do you have a bedtime do you have meal times do you have structure. Says, well, well, what good would all this structure do me? Is it direct? Is it conscious? Is it right here? No. But your life is too big for you to consciously manage it. In other words, lots the, the big areas of your life have to be managed, and you're going to need to have both lobes of your brain engaged if you're going to make progress moving forward. And this is, in many ways, where we get to Jordan Peterson's Darwinian truth, because, okay, so so I need rituals that don't necessarily look direct. I need patterns that don't necessarily look direct. I, I, there are ways that I have to pursue this, and, and they might not be all over the place now. How can I know what they are? 
And again, Nassim Tlaib and Jordan Peterson both say, well, there's this Darwinian truth aspect, which is durability is a helpful indicator for short-lived conscious creatures. What do you mean? Looking past, looking in the, looking in the back, looking in terms of what has worked in the past over long periods of time, the oldest things will often be the things that guide us better towards the future. They'll be most the more durable, the more anti-fragile. There will be things, and they're going to have to be communal. Now, what that really means is that the personal is going to have to have priority over the political. And so when people look around and see people unfriending people on Facebook and families breaking up and marriages breaking up and, you know, with all the talk about racism, a recent study showed that people are now more upset if a, if their, a parent is more upset if their, their son or daughter of marriable age brings over someone of the opposite political party than from another race. So racism is the big metric? No, political Partisanship is a huge thing, but this is a consequence of we're no longer mediating, mediating everything in terms of personal relationships, both with God number two and also with each other. And now it simply becomes political based on who are you voting for, Trump or Biden? That's a bad way to organize your life. It's a bad way to figure out how to live. But why? Because the personal lasts longer than the political. It has far broader bandwidth. You can relate to people in a far more different ways. Now, there's going to be some ways that you relate well and some ways that you don't. And anybody who's been in a long-term relationship, such as a marriage for a significant amount of time, knows this. And both people are moving targets. It is more flexible and it's more 4P. What do I mean by that? It's propositional. It's perspectival. It's procedural. It's participatory. Personal relationships are more 4P than Trump or Biden. That's why the personal has to have priority over the political. And, and you'll keep defaulting to cargo cult behavior. And, and, and on one hand, we say, well, that, that seems kind of silly, but you know, the cargo cults of these people groups weren't stupid. They were limited. They, they didn't have knowledge of the bigger world. If they had knowledge of the bigger world, they probably could have found other ways to be more productive than the cargo cults. But actually, the cargo cults worked for them because more people came back from the first world and filmed them and they built relationships and, and increasingly they were pulled into the larger world global network. Was that an upgrade for them? Well, that's, these are tough things. It's sort of the, the a, a rebuilding block for epistemological recalibrations in periods of rapid change. You have to sort of build from the ground up, which is why ritual, tradition, all of these things. And when someone is constructing their own personal life, okay, are you going to bed on time? Are you getting up on time? Tell me about your alcohol consumption. Tell me about your tell me about your eating schedules. Tell me about your routines. Tell me about where your conscious thought is directed. Is everything political? Are you sitting in front of MSNBC or Fox News all the time? Are you on Twitter all the time? Are you in front of all of these things that have been gamed in terms of your limbic systems? Or are you, in effect, using far more ancient practices to draw you into far longer conversations with ancestors than just the chattering monkeys today? And, well, how is that going to happen? Well, it's probably going to look like religion S. And you're going to begin to approach the world with the spirit of geometry looking for better, or the spirit of finesse looking for better geometry. Now, the natural supernatural distinction is, as Alistair McGrath pointed out to Brett Weinstein, quite new. That line on your map has never quite given you what you thought it should. The ancients understood levels of power and the normal and the exceptional. As, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, when Mary comes up pregnant and says, it's by the Holy Spirit, yeah, eyebrows are going to be raised. It doesn't mean that there wasn't abuses to be wrung out of the old systems. And, and so when you look at a movement like the Enlightenment, tons of good stuff came from the Enlightenment, and we ought to be able to do a mature assessment of it. 
But in, with almost every revolution, there's overreach. And we should learn not only from the revolutions of the past, but the overreaches of the past to continue to, with greater and greater definition, recalibrate and, and get a better sense of, okay, this, this we can pursue with the spirit of geometry, this we can pursue with the spirit of finesse. This is a good operation for us to close one eye and say, I'm only going to look at it with the scientific vision. This... Well, anytime, anytime you're getting into normative conversations, well, they're going to have to be about far larger things. And part of the reason that, for the most part, Western secular society borrows wholesale from Christian, Christian normality is, is because they don't have another. And it simply takes a very long time and a very wide purview and, and the kind of really expansive, intuitive thinking over long periods of time to, to construct a metaphysic and a moral, ethical worldview, religion W. It takes a very long time. And that's why these are almost always tied to religion because religious conversations are those very, very long, broad conversations by which we're all working out those things. And, you know, so when Sam, ha has, when Sam Harris looks at the Bible and says, oh, but, you know, but, but, but slavery. And I say, or do you mean to tell me that if you go into some Baptist church, they're practicing slavery there now? Why aren't they? Well, because lots of things have changed. Yeah, lots of things have changed. And the religious people have been having these conversations and been working through these things. And again, the, the, the consciousness and the rationality and the intelligence, that's all good. But the, the, the process, if you think about ourselves, not simply as being the outside of the computer typing on the keyboards, but if you think about societies in a sense as being massive calculation machines of trial and error through talking via culture net, you can see that over thousands of years and millions of conversations and all of this intentionality and all of this writing and all of this acting these things out, the religious, the religious layers of culture are, are the ones that in many ways have been the most persistent in in looking at the world. So it means that we will need to have more courage than we thought. We cannot manage the future. And no matter if Brett Weinstein has a YouTube following the size of PewDiePie, I wouldn't at all be surprised to see Brett Weinstein decide to go into politics, to run, you know, maybe not this time, but to run for mayor of Portland or 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 governor of Oregon or, you know, and, and I, I, I'm not saying Brett Weinstein would be a terrible politician. He's a, he's a very smart guy. But we can't manage the future. And so, yeah, we do our little part to add our little influence. But what is managing the future? Well, and then suddenly we're in the midst of all of these far larger paradigmatic structures that we can only conceptualize as principalities, powers, use all this very old language and machinery, which which doesn't lend itself to all of the granular political. And so what are we doing? It's skin knees in the dark tunnel of the precocious. That's in many ways where we're at. And and so, you know, some of these some of these critters, Tom Holland, Douglas Murray, Jordan Peterson, they're they're inching their way forward, but but not just high status people. Again, we just had the question and answer in the in the Discord today, and and when I look at what's happening on the Bridges of Meaning Discord, I see people doing that in their own lives, and they're they're working through the questions, and they're trying out new church, or they're trying out church in general, or they're trying out new relationships, or they're trying out new thoughts and new ideas, and I I just see in a sense the you know the humanity doing the calculations, not just mentally, but in real time and in real life, because in many ways, as Jordan Peterson, it's one thing to think it in your head and you should think it in your head, but you have to try it in real life because the world is too complex. And so you won't know anything unless you're trying it in real life. But, but that's what we're doing. 
I've this is again well, just one video in the monks in the midst of many as I continue to think about these things and I hope again I hope my ramblings are helpful and I suppose if you're still watching they have been so thank you <laughs>